Hello students, this video is being recorded in the summer of 2020, right after the end of the spring semester and in the midst of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Since we do not yet know for sure what format our classes will take in the fall, and since there's some likelihood that at least some of us, both students and faculty, will have to be away from campus for a time should the mitigation plans prove ineffective or should compliance with or enforcement of public health guidelines prove impossible, I am preparing a video version of each of my lectures for the class to have it ready if and when it is needed. It's also the case that necessary distancing requirements in the classrooms may make it impossible that the entire class can be in the same room at the same time. In that case, those whose turn it is to stay away from campus may find these video lectures a better option than relying on a live classroom feed via Zoom or some other technology. So if you're watching this video, it means that we are, for reasons of public and personal health, still unable to meet together in a traditional face-to-face -face classroom format. All the same, I'll continue to do my best to teach you what I know with whatever tools I have at my disposal. Enjoy the lecture. So now we undertake a study of the first of three Abraham Lincoln speeches. And this one is Lincoln's famous House Divided speech, which he delivered to the Republican State Convention in Illinois in 1858. But first, let's take a look at the early life of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was born on the 12th of February near Hodgdenville, Kentucky. He's actually descended from a man named Samuel Lincoln, who was from Hingham, England, and one of the very earliest settlers of Hingham, Massachusetts. In 1816, the Lincoln family moved from Kentucky to Spencer County, Indiana, we see here, by the way, in the top photo, the cabin that Lincoln's family occupied when they lived in Indiana. And then in 1830, they moved on further to Macon County, Illinois. By this time, Abraham Lincoln was almost 22 years old, and he departed from his family to make his own home in New Salem, Illinois, where he also was a partner in a general store. In 1832, he served briefly as a militia captain in the Black Hawk War, which was a conflict with Native American tribes on the frontier near the Mississippi River. In 1834, Lincoln was elected to the Illinois House of Representatives as a member of the Whig Party, and it was then that he adopted the Free Soil ideology. The free soil position was one that was not an abolitionist position. Free soilers thought that the federal government had no authority to interfere with slavery where it already existed in the southern states. But they did think that Congress and the federal government had not only the power, but the obligation to prevent the spread of slavery into the new territories and new states that would be formed from those new territories. In 1836, Lincoln was admitted to the Illinois Bar, and he begins practicing law in Springfield. And then in 1842, he married Mary Todd in Springfield, Illinois. In 1846, Lincoln was elected to the United States House of Representatives from the Illinois 7th District. Again, he was still a member of the Whig Party. In Congress, he opposed the Mexican War and supported the Wilmot Proviso. The Wilmot Proviso aimed to apply that free soil doctrine to the territory that was acquired from Mexico in the Mexican-American War. So it would extend the congressional prohibition to all of that new territory. Lincoln also supported the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia, which was under the direct control of the federal government. However, in 1848, keeping his promise to serve only one term, Lincoln did not seek re-election, and he returned to his law practice in Illinois. 
1854, he opposed the Kansas-Nebraska Act of Stephen A. Douglas, who was uh, the United States Senator from Illinois, and he made his public opposition in what is known as his Peoria speech. And there also he made explicit his opposition to what he called the monstrous injustice of slavery. In 1856, he joined the new Republican Party and the following year opposed the results of the Supreme Court decision in the Dred Scott case. And you'll see Lincoln talk about the Dred Scott case and the Kansas-Nebraska Act in his House Divided speech. In 1858, Lincoln received the nomination of the Republican Party to run against Stephen Douglas for the United States Senate from Illinois. And his House Divided speech is the speech he gives at the Illinois Republican Convention after receiving the nomination. And during that Senate campaign, in addition, during that Senate campaign in 1858, we have the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates. There are seven debates between Lincoln and Stephen Douglas, one in each of the Illinois congressional districts. And in those debates, Lincoln and Douglas focus almost all of their attention on the single issue of the spread of slavery into the territories. So let's take a look at Lincoln's House Divided speech. First of all, we can ask the question about the genre of the speech. We know that he gives the speech at the Illinois State Republican Convention, and there are clearly elements of the speech which suggest its deliberative nature because Lincoln is talking about future policy regarding slavery in the territories. But more important, I think, and this is the main point that is made by Michael Leff in his study of the speech, the speech can be understood best as a campaign speech, that is, as a speech in the context of the political contest between Republicans and Democrats, between Lincoln and Douglas in Illinois in 1858. And so if we keep that in mind, that this is essentially a campaign speech, we'll understand better some of the strategies that Lincoln uses in addressing the convention crowd. So then what is the exigence here? Lincoln's just been nominated as the candidate for the Republican Party in the Illinois race for United States Senator. And so the obvious immediate exigence is election to office. Lincoln wants to get more votes than Douglas. And so if we think about that in connection with our generic conclusion that the speech is a campaign speech, it makes sense that the exigence is Lincoln is seeking as much political support as he can get. And then what about the audience for the speech? There were obviously Republicans attending the convention who heard Lincoln give the speech in person, but the speech is also widely published in newspapers in Chicago and other Illinois cities and it is even published in, in other cities across the United States. And so Lincoln begins to gain actually a national following as a result of this speech. He becomes one of the prominent Republicans in the new party in the United States. And then what are the constraints? Again, if we think about the context of the speech as a political speech, as a campaign speech, one of the constraints here that Lincoln has to address is the status of Stephen Douglas as a sitting United States Senator. And not just any Senator, but one of the more prominent Senators in the United States Senate. We know, for example, from our brief study of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, that Douglas was a prominent figure in promoting that act. He becomes one of the targets for Charles Sumner's speech in the crime against Kansas. So Douglas was a very well-known character, not only in Illinois politics, but in national politics. And so Lincoln has to address a constituency. He has to address potential voters in a campaign against someone who is thoroughly well-known by that same constituency. Lincoln, in contrast, is not as well-known. 
And one of the constraints he has going into the election is to draw some very sharp distinctions between his position and that of his opponent, Stephen Douglas. And indeed, as you watch the developments of the speech, you'll see that much of it is designed to draw those distinctions with a sharp line. So before we take a look at the critical questions related to this speech and at the article by Michael Leff and at the text of the speech, I think it will help a lot if we briefly review some of the political issues related to the spread of slavery into the United States territories. How did the federal government make various attempts to deal with this very controversial question? So we begin, first of all, with the Missouri Doctrine. We talked about this briefly in connection with the Charles Sumner speech, but the Missouri Doctrine was based on that dividing line that was established by the Missouri Compromise of 1820. And it said that any territory north of that 3630 line of latitude within the Louisiana Purchase be kept free from slavery. And indeed, even after the Compromise of 1850, which was an attempt in part to deal with the new territory acquired from Mexico as a result of the Mexican-American War, the principle of the Missouri Doctrine was maintained. Essentially, the latitude line of the Missouri Compromise was drawn farther to the west so that it covered all of what was New Mexico territory and what is now the states of Arizona, New Mexico, and parts of Texas. It remained the consistent policy by which the federal government dealt with the question of the spread of slavery. But then in 1854, with the Kansas-Nebraska Act, uh, we have what is known as the Doctrine of Popular Sovereignty, and this is the idea, again, as we discussed briefly in connection with the Charles Sumner speech, the idea that the people of the territories themselves will decide whether or not to have slavery. That is, in forming a constitution, they would either make a pro-slavery or an anti-slavery constitution. And this was the position of Stephen A. Douglas. And it was the position that was embodied in the Kansas-Nebraska Act, of 1854. But of course, as Lincoln points out in the House Divided speech, the Kansas-Nebraska Act completely overturns the Missouri Compromise. That is, it eliminates the geographic division of the country. And in the bargain of the Missouri Compromise, when Northerners and those who opposed slavery thought they had kept Kansas and Nebraska free from slavery, now the Kansas-Nebraska Act potentially opened up those territories to the introduction of slavery. And then we have the free soil position, and this was the position of Lincoln and the Republican Party, and it was the doctrine contained within the Wilmot Proviso, which was an attempt to add an amendment to the appropriation bill by which all of that southwestern territory would be acquired from Mexico. The Wilmot Proviso said the money will be appropriated by Congress provided that none of that territory will be open to slavery. So the free soil position is the idea that territories ought to be entirely free, that slavery ought to be confined to the southern states where it already existed. And it also says that the Congress has a right to limit the expansion of slavery. So this, as we said, was the position that Lincoln took. Lincoln was not an abolitionist, but a free soiler. And then there is the Southern Doctrine. And the Southern Doctrine viewed the territories as the common inheritance of both North and South. And because of that, the Southerners thought the territories ought to be entirely open to slavery that by virtue of the territories being held in common by all the states, the property of the people of any state cannot be excluded. And that includes property and other human beings or slaves. And indeed, 
This is the doctrine that ends up being confirmed by the Dred Scott decision of 1857. That decision decided that Dred Scott, who was a slave and owned by a master in Missouri, but who had been taken into Indiana and Wisconsin territory, both of which were free, nevertheless did not obtain his freedom. So, in effect, the Supreme Court said, first of all, Negro slaves, as the phrase was used then, Negro slaves were not citizens and they did not have a legal standing under the court, but even if they did, a slave that was brought into a free state or a free territory did not gain his freedom. And so as Lincoln interprets this in the House Divided speech, this particular Supreme Court decision overturns not only the Missouri Compromise and the Compromise of 1850, but it actually overturns the whole doctrine of popular sovereignty. For suppose the people of Kansas or the people of Nebraska decide that they want an anti-slavery constitution. The Supreme Court has just said that a slave owner from Missouri who brings his slaves into Kansas or into Nebraska, even if they have an anti-slavery constitution, still retains property in those slaves. And so, as Lincoln says, with the Dred Scott decision, squatter sovereignty, which is how he describes Douglas's doctrine, squatter sovereignty has been squatted out of existence. So with this background on the politics of the spread of slavery into the territories, we're ready to take a look at Lincoln's speech. So here are some of the critical questions we can ask. First of all, what is Lincoln's main persuasive purpose in the speech? And how do each of the parts of the speech relate to that main purpose? Who was Lincoln's audience? So we've already discussed this a little bit, but it'll be an important question to keep in mind as you read through the speech that Lincoln is making essentially a campaign speech that he's aiming to appeal to the voters of Illinois in a contest against Stephen Douglas. And then how does Lincoln's opening sentence, his series of questions, if we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we would better know what to do and how to do it. How does that opening sentence structure the entire speech? So look closely at that in your reading, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well when we get to the text of the speech. And then we can ask, how does the metaphor of house building by, as Lincoln says, Stephen, Franklin, Roger, and James, how does that metaphor of house building make Lincoln's task easier than what a simple literal statement of his belief in a conspiracy? And again, we talked a little bit about this in connection with Charles Sumner, the belief, especially on the part of those in the North who were anti-slavery, the belief in a slave power conspiracy. And we get a glimpse of Lincoln's understanding of that, or at least Lincoln's use of that widespread belief in this speech. And then what other metaphors are important for Lincoln's accomplishment of his rhetorical task? So as you're reading, look especially at the metaphors of machinery and building, house building, scaffolding, and the like that Lincoln uses to describe the political events of the 1850s. And then what are the other marks of Lincoln's style in the House Divided? How important especially is narrative, historical narrative in the speech? So pay attention as you're reading to those places where Lincoln offers a kind of historical account of what has gone on as he focuses on the recent political events of the past, how does that structuring of the narrative help him to make his overall case in the political contest with Stephen Douglas? And then finally, why does Lincoln propose the possibility of a conspiracy in which Douglas himself is involved? What does that do for Lincoln's chances in the upcoming election? So next, before we look at the Lincoln text itself, let's see what Michael Leff had to say about Lincoln's House Divided speech. Now, after Leff introduces Lincoln's opening lines of the speech, he says, 
These words and the others that follow in the address constitute what is one of the most controversial and influential documents in American political history. So again, that partly explains why we're reading it today in the Great Speakers and Speeches class. But as Left goes on, judgment on both counts now seems beyond doubt. Controversy, in fact, began before the formal presentation of the speech. Many of Lincoln's friends and advisors attending a rehearsal performance urged him to revise and soften its content, fearing that his message was ahead of its time. Subsequently, the speech proved a bone of contention in the senatorial campaign, left its mark on the presidential politics of 1860, and in that presidential contest, Lincoln runs again against Stephen Douglas, this time for the U.S. presidency. And the speech has persisted in generating argument up to the present. So for a lot of reasons, then, it's a good subject for our further study in this class. None of Lincoln's other great speeches has provoked so much and such strong debate as this one. So that's the reason why we're reading the House Divided speech. But then what does Leff have to say about it? Taking issue with both Cole and Nevins, Don Fehrenbacher, and here Leff is talking about historians who have studied and written about the speech. Fehrenbacher argues that the speech is a unified whole. It is fashionable, Fehrenbacher notes, to treat everything that Lincoln said after the first two or three minutes as anticlimax, to look upon his argument as running downhill from high principles to low partisanship. Yet the careful reader will discover that from beginning to end, the speech is dominated by a single coherent theme. That theme is based in the attempt to erect a barrier dividing the aspirations of the Republican Party from the policies of the incumbent Democratic Senator Stephen Douglas. In more specific terms, says Leff, Lincoln seeks to prevent Douglas from using his doctrine of popular sovereignty as a compromise position by cutting out from under Douglas's feet the middle ground on which that issue stood. And so indeed, as Left proceeds in his analysis, he's going to discuss not only the historical context and the political circumstances, but look very closely at the text itself. Left's analysis is a very good example of what we would call close textual criticism. So here is Left's critical thesis. In contrast to the other leading historical writers, Fehrenbacher recognizes that the House Divided speech is primarily a rhetorical document. This recognition, coupled with a formidable knowledge of the historical context, allows Fehrenbacher to develop by far the most plausible account of the structure and meaning of the speech yet produced. He has provided an admirable example of how a historian can shed light on a speech text and a valuable point of departure for further critical inquiry. In my analysis, says Leff, I will adopt his thesis about the purpose of the speech and, with some modification, follow his scheme for separating the major divisions within the text. Nevertheless, from the peculiar angle of vision of the rhetorical critic, Fehrenbacher's account of the speech is still incomplete. It requires elaboration, and indeed that's what Leff offers in this detailed critical reading of Lincoln's House Divided speech. So Leff then undertakes the analysis looking first at the opening section. He says the opening House Divided section deserves special notice. It is quite short, occupying less than 7% of the text, but it compresses much into the short compass and analysis of it has an important bearing on the interpretation of the text as a whole. The first sentence develops spatial and temporal reference points that, as we shall see, Lincoln uses to inform the organization of the entire speech. This complex conditional sentence begins with reference to spatial orientation, where are we, and then is balanced by a reference to both space and time, whither are we tending? 
these elements in the antecedent of the conditional sentence in turn are balanced by the two indirect questions in the consequent, what to do and how to do it, both of them relating to future policy. Lincoln then introduces a pattern generally similar to the ones he uses in his other major orations, a pattern of temporal progression. He indicates movement from the present situation to tendencies in the present pointing to the future to the prospect of action in the somewhat more remote future. And so what Leff is talking about here is that opening line, the opening sentence of the Lincoln speech. If we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could better judge what to do and how to do it. And we'll talk about that passage when we turn to the text of Lincoln's speech. Leff also talks about the house divided image. The conception of the union as a house, he says, is hardly original with Lincoln, but it is thoroughly appropriate to his purposes. The house is a familiar symbol, common to everyone, but at the same time, the biblical reference, because the house divided image comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the biblical reference invests the symbol with an elevated moral sentiment. Furthermore, the symbol is well adapted to arrest and frame the progression of time, since, among other things, the house is a generational symbol. It not only stands for where we live, but also for who we are as members of families connected by stable ties to a single place through the passage of time. Finally, we should note that the striking power of this image is enhanced by its placement in the order of the text. It comes as an interruption at a moment when our expectations have been prodded in a different direction. To appreciate this effect, imagine the house divided quotation occurring either at the very beginning of the speech or inserted after sentence nine at the conclusion of the introductory section. So again, let's go back to the text and just read that portion up to the part where Lincoln says the house divided image. Mr. President and gentlemen of the convention, if we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could better judge what to do and how to do it. We are now far into the fifth year since a policy was initiated with the avowed object and confident promise of putting an end to slavery agitation. Under the operation of that policy, that agitation has not only not ceased, but has constantly augmented. In my opinion, it will not cease until a crisis shall have been reached and passed. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And so again, when we get to the Lincoln text, we'll talk a little bit more about that passage at the opening of the Lincoln speech. And then Left talks about the function of Lincoln's speech as campaign rhetoric, and in particular, the conspiracy argument that Lincoln develops in the speech and which he connects to Stephen Douglas and the Democrats. Viewed as a whole, says Left, the conspiracy section provided a striking example of Lincoln's rhetorical artistry. In fact, however, his case rested on very fragile evidence. There was no foundation to the charge that Douglas actively conspired with Taney, Pierce, and Buchanan. And while the threat of a Dred Scott decision might not have been an absurd bogey, as Nevins had claimed, it was at best a remote possibility. Nevertheless, such fears and speculations were present in the public mind in 1858. They were raised in Congress by Northern senators, such as Seward and Fessenden, and they were brooded about by the Republican press. Much of the discourse on these matters took on a melodramatic, almost hysterical cast. Lincoln's achievement was to fathom the public mind and gather the elements of hysteria, rumor, and melodrama into a coherent form that when combined with his own sense of the direction of events, 
yielded a rhetorically powerful vision. So now let's take a look at some key passages in the House Divided speech. And here we go again to that opening section and we'll kind of unpack this a little bit as we read. So Lincoln says, if we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could then better judge what to do and how to do it. So let's stop at that first sentence because as Left points out, this kind of structures the whole organization of Lincoln's speech, the answers to these questions. So as we go along, Lincoln's going to investigate where we are. That is, what's the state of the country now, and especially what's the state of the country in connection to the question of the spread of slavery into the territories. That is, thinking about pieces of congressional legislation, court decisions, presidential uh, announcements and the like. What situation are we in now? And then, in relation to that, whither we are tending. Now, whither is kind of an archaic word, but it means in what direction, in other words. Where are we headed? So what's the tendency, in other words? So Lincoln wants to know, where are we now? That is, what's the status quo? And what direction are we heading in with regard to the spread of slavery? And if we can figure that out, he says, if we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could then better judge what to do and how to do it. So he comes around finally to answer the question, what to do and how to do it toward the end of the speech after he establishes where it is we are now and what direction we're heading in. So then he begins this historical narrative in the next sentence. We are now far into the fifth year since a policy was initiated with the avowed object and confident promise of putting an end to slavery agitation. Under the operation of that policy, that agitation has not only not ceased, but has constantly augmented. So let's pause there, because what's Lincoln talking about? First of all, he's talking about we're in the fifth year since a policy was initiated. He's talking about the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. So if you count 1854, 1855, 1856, 1857, and we're in the fifth year of that policy when Lincoln is giving the speech, 1858. So we're in the fifth year since a policy, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, was initiated. And if we go by what Douglas has promised, right, that would end slavery agitation because it would leave it up to the people of the territories to decide whether they wanted to have slavery or not. And so all of the agitation from abolitionists and from the pro-slavery side would end with the Kansas-Nebraska Act, according to Stephen Douglas. So Lincoln says, we are now far into the fifth year since a policy was initiated with the avowed object and confident promise of putting an end to slavery agitation. But, as Lincoln points out, under the operation of that policy, that agitation has not only not ceased, but has constantly augmented. Augmented means it's grown larger, it's gotten bigger, it's more vociferous. So it hasn't accomplished, that is the Kansas-Nebraska Act, hasn't accomplished what Douglas promised, that is it did not put an end to slavery agitation. In fact, it's only made things worse. And we saw some of that, certainly, in the Charles Sumner crime against Kansas speech and the reaction to the Sumner speech. And so Lincoln goes on, in my opinion, it will not cease until a crisis shall have been reached and passed. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And so the United States, of course, in 1858, is indeed a house divided against itself. The nation is half slave and half free, and it remains divided. So Lincoln says, it will remain divided until there's a crisis reached, and only after a crisis is reached will that division cease. 
And so Lincoln explains, I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction, or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become alike lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. And then Lincoln asks, have we no tendency to the latter condition? So Lincoln has already answered in this first paragraph those first two questions. Where are we now and whither are we tending? So where are we now? We are in a nation divided. We're half slave and half free, and the slavery agitation has not diminished with the Kansas-Nebraska Act. That's where we are now. And so he asks, after reviewing what has happened, he says with the closing sentence of this opening paragraph, have we no tendency to the latter condition? In other words, when we ask, whither are we tending? Don't we have to answer that we're headed toward becoming a nation of all slavery? That is, slavery seems to be headed toward becoming lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. Of course, Lincoln's position and the position of the Republican Party aligns with what he identifies here as the opponents of slavery. The free soil position will do exactly what Lincoln says here, arrest the further spread of slavery and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction. And then we turn to the very next section of the speech where Lincoln begins to introduce this idea of a conspiracy. Let anyone who doubts carefully contemplate that now almost complete legal combination, piece of machinery, so to speak, compounded of the Nebraska doctrine and the Dred Scott decision. Let him consider not only what work the machinery is adapted to do and how well adapted, but also let him study the history of its construction and trace if he can, or rather fail if he can to trace, the evidence of design and concert of action among its chief architects from the beginning. So this goes back to one of our critical questions that we discussed, the question of Lincoln's other metaphors. And we see the metaphor of machinery here and the work the machinery is designed or adapted to do. So that's a metaphor of industrial construction. A machine is designed to accomplish a particular purpose. And so Lincoln uses that image to describe the political events of the previous decade. And in particular, the combination of the Dred Scott decision and the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And then Lincoln begins to describe that history of its construction. And he says in this next paragraph here, the new year of 1854 found slavery excluded from more than half the states by state constitutions and from most of the national territory by congressional prohibition. And that congressional prohibition was the combination of the Missouri Compromise, which covered the Louisiana Purchase, and the Compromise of 1850, which in effect extended the Missouri Compromise line all the way to the Pacific, although all of California was a free state. But then, Lincoln says, four days later commenced the struggle, which ended in repealing that congressional prohibition. What Lincoln is referring to here is the congressional debate over the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And of course, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which includes now the doctrine of popular sovereignty, essentially makes void that congressional prohibition and geographic division which kept the area of Kansas and Nebraska territories free from slavery. 
This opened all the national territory to slavery, says Lincoln. Why? Because it left it open to popular sovereignty. So it was possible that people moving into those territories might elect a pro-slavery constitution. So Lincoln says, that was the first point gained. But so far, Congress only had acted, and an endorsement by the people real or apparent, was indispensable to save the point already gained and give chance for more. And so what Lincoln is doing here as he continues that historical narrative is saying, look, the first point was the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act with this doctrine of popular sovereignty. But that could be endorsed during a presidential election. And the presidential election would take place in 1856. So you had the outgoing president, Franklin Pierce of New Hampshire, and you had the incoming president, James Buchanan. And both of them would offer endorsements of the doctrine of popular sovereignty and of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, at least as Lincoln describes it later in the speech, as a temporary scaffolding until such time as the Dred Scott decision would confirm the nationalization of slavery. So as Lincoln continues, uh, now focused on the question of Kansas and what's going on in Kansas and bleeding Kansas, where there's a great dispute, sometimes leading to violent conflict over conflicting or competing constitutions in Kansas, one a pro-slavery constitution and one an anti-slavery constitution. So as Lincoln says, at length a squabble springs up between the president and the author of the Nebraska bill on the mere question of fact whether the Lecompton Constitution was or was not in any just sense made by the people of Kansas. And in that squabble, the latter declares that all he wants is a fair vote for the people and that he cares not whether slavery be voted down or voted up. Now, why would Douglas say that? Because Douglas is the advocate of the doctrine of popular sovereignty. So he cannot take a position for or against slavery so long as the people themselves have decided to have this or that kind of pro or anti-slavery constitution. So as Lincoln goes on, I do not understand his declaration that he cares not whether slavery be voted down or voted up to be intended by him other than as an apt definition of the policy he would impress upon the public mind, which is the doctrine of popular sovereignty. The principle for which he declares he has suffered much and is ready to suffer to the end. And well may he cling to that principle, if he has any paternal feeling, well, may he cling to it. That principle is the only shred left of his original Nebraska doctrine. Under the Dred Scott decision, squatter sovereignty squatted out of existence, tumbled down like temporary scaffolding, like the mold of the foundry served through one blast and fell back into loose sand, helped to carry an election, and then was kicked to the winds. His late joint struggle with the Republicans against the Lecompton Constitution involved nothing of the original Nebraska doctrine. That struggle was made on a point the right of a people to make their own constitution, upon which he and the Republicans have never differed. The several points of the Dred Scott decision in connection with Senator Douglas's care not policy constitute the piece of machinery in its present state of advancement. This was the third point gained. So we have a complex passage here, lots of historical narrative. Lincoln is again sharing a narrative of political events that have occurred over the, over the previous several years. But the point here is that Senator Douglas seems to have gained some political support because he agrees with Republicans that the Lecompton Constitution, which was the pro-slavery constitution, was in fact invalid. And both the Republicans and Douglas agreed that it was invalid because it was decided or ratified on the basis of electoral fraud. 
we talked a little bit in connection with the Charles Sumner speech about the so-called border ruffians, that is, those who came across pro-slavery forces that came across from the state of Missouri, a pro-slavery state, into Kansas territory so they could influence the election and got past the Lecompton or pro-slavery constitution. Now, Douglas is not saying he's against slavery, but he's saying he's against the Lecompton Constitution because the, of the electoral fraud involved in ratifying it. And so Douglas is gaining some support from even among Republicans because they look at that as something they agree with Douglas on. And so Lincoln is trying to say, look, Douglas is with us on this one question, but he is not against slavery or against the spread of slavery. Indeed, because of the Dred Scott decision, everything that he promised in the Kansas-Nebraska Act has been made null and void. The Dred Scott decision, as Lincoln points out here, in that decision, squatter sovereignty, or in other words, the doctrine of popular sovereignty in the Kansas-Nebraska Act, was squatted out of existence. And so here Lincoln fits that into the political conspiracy narrative by saying it acted like temporary scaffolding. So here again, some of the metaphors of building construction, right? The temporary scaffolding of the Kansas-Nebraska Act is put up to make way for the Dred Scott decision, and then it's taken down. It helps to carry the election of James Buchanan and then it is taken down because it's accomplished its purpose. And then the next step is to introduce the doctrine contained in the Dred Scott decision, which is the Southern doctrine, which would nationalize slavery and potentially make it legal in all of the territories. And as Lincoln suggests, perhaps only one more court decision away to making slavery legal even in all the northern states, all the free states. And so this is the third point gained in that political conspiracy. So Lincoln then gets to the explicit articulation of this conspiracy theme or conspiracy image in the speech. And he says, we cannot absolutely know that all these exact adaptations are the result of pre-concert. But when we see a lot of framed timbers, different portions of which we know have been gotten out at different times and places, and by different workmen, Stephen, Franklin, Roger, and James, for instance, and when we see these timbers joined together and see they exactly make the frame of a house or a mill, all the tenons and mortises exactly fitting and all the lengths and proportions of the different pieces exactly adapted to their respective places and not a piece too many or too few, not omitting even scaffolding. Or if a single piece be lacking, we can see the place in the frame exactly fitted and prepared to yet bring such piece in. In such a case, we find it impossible not to believe that Stephen and Franklin and Roger and James all understood one another from the beginning and all worked upon a common plan or draft drawn up before the first lick was struck. So the Stephen, Franklin, Roger, and James that Lincoln refers to using the first names, but everybody knows who he's referring to, are Stephen Douglas, his Democratic opponent in the Illinois Senate race, Franklin Pierce, the Democratic outgoing president from New Hampshire, Roger Taney, the United States Supreme Court Justice, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court who wrote the Dred Scott decision, and James Buchanan, the incoming Democratic president. And so these are the chief builders, the chief conspirators, if you will. So again, we see how Lincoln uses that metaphor of building, talking about the frame of a house and the design and the plan and all the different parts coming from different places, the framed timbers and the like. This is Lincoln's metaphor of building, which takes this abstract notion of a conspiracy 
and gives it a certain solidity, a certain materialization, a certain concrete value, much easier to grasp and understand for most listeners. And then we turn to a passage toward the end of the speech, another well-known passage in Lincoln's speech. And here is where he answers the final two questions from the opening sentence of the address. He says to the audience, we shall lie down pleasantly dreaming that the people of Missouri are on the verge of making their state free, and we shall awake to the reality instead that the Supreme Court has made Illinois a slave state. So let's stop just there. Lincoln said, remember, as we talked about the metaphor of constructing the building, Lincoln said, if there was one piece missing, we see exactly where it should go. Well, he's talking about some future Supreme Court decision. The Dred Scott decision made a judgment only about free territories and what happens to a slave brought into a free territory and that the Congress could not prohibit slavery in those territories, even under the doctrine of popular sovereignty. And Lincoln's point here is to say, look, it takes only one more Supreme Court decision to make a state like New Hampshire into a slave state. It is for sure that New Hampshire emancipated slaves and prohibited slavery starting in 1788, but all it would take would be a new Supreme Court decision that says no state constitution or no state law can prohibit the introduction of slavery into their state. That would nationalize slavery. Maybe it would be unlikely that that would happen, but Lincoln is using the threat of that or the fear of that here to suggest it takes only one more step. And so Lincoln says, what we have to do is to meet and overthrow the power of that dynasty. He's referring here again to the slave power, as we learned when we talked about Charles Sumner's speech. To meet and overthrow the power of that dynasty is the work now before all those who would prevent that consummation. So it is the work of the Republican Convention. It is the work of Republican voters in Illinois. It is the work of Republican voters across the country. So that is why Lincoln says, this is what we have to do. That is, elect Republicans or elect those who will prevent this spread of slavery, not only into the territories, but into the free states. So then he says, but how can we best do it? And his answer to that question is, elect Abraham Lincoln, don't elect Stephen Douglas. Recall that Douglas has actually gained some support, even among some Republicans, because of his opposition to the pro-slavery constitution in Kansas. But Douglas's opposition was not based on the fact that it was pro-slavery, his opposition was based on the fact it was fraudulently ratified because of election violations. And so Lincoln is saying, look, you need a dependable anti-slavery person who will consistently oppose the spread of slavery, not somebody like Douglas, who just happens to agree with us on this one point. And so he says to the members of the convention, there are those who denounce us openly to their own friends and yet whisper us softly that Senator Douglas is the aptest instrument there is with which to effect that object. They wish us to infer all from the facts that he now has a little quarrel with the present head of the dynasty and that he has regularly voted with us on a single point upon which he and we have never differed. They remind us that he is a great man and that the largest of us are very small ones. Let this be granted, but a living dog is better than a dead lion. Judge Douglas, if not a dead lion for this work, is at least a caged and toothless one. How can he oppose the advances of slavery? He don't care anything about it. His avowed mission is impressing the public heart to care nothing about it. So here, Lincoln introduces this new metaphor of the living dog, this image that he takes again from the Bible, from the book of Ecclesiastes. And Lincoln says, a living dog is better than a dead lion. 
That is to say, in the fight against slavery, certainly a lion is more powerful than a dog. But if the dog is alive and the lion is dead, which would you rather have? A living dog is better than a dead lion. And Douglas, if not a dead lion for this work, is at least a caged and toothless one. That is, he's without any power or potency in opposing slavery because he does not care one way or the other whether slavery is voted up or voted down. That's Lincoln's campaign message here, to pick the candidate, Abraham Lincoln, who will be a consistent opponent of the spread of slavery, who has from the beginning taken a free soil position and not rested on this compromised position of popular sovereignty. So we can see then how it's best read, the House Divided speech is best read as a campaign speech. And not only is this a campaign speech for Lincoln, but it is really the opening salvo in the campaign against Douglas, because we move from Lincoln's speech in the Republican State Convention in Illinois to a series of debates between Lincoln and Douglas, the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates. They debated seven times once in each of the congressional districts where neither of them had already spoken. And all of those debates are focused almost entirely on this same question that is addressed in Lincoln's House Divided speech. And that is the question of how to prevent the spread of slavery into the territories. And as it turns out, Lincoln loses the election to Douglas in 1858. Douglas is reelected as the United States Senator, a Democrat from the state of Illinois. But just two years later, they face off again for the presidency. Lincoln and Douglas are the principal candidates for the Democratic and Republican Party, um, respectively. And this time in 1860, Lincoln wins the national election and becomes the first Republican president. That, of course, leads to the immediate secession of seven states in the South because they believe Lincoln threatens the institution of slavery even where it already exists, despite the fact that he makes many pronouncements to the contrary. And so as we turn to our next two speeches, the Gettysburg Address and Lincoln's second inaugural, these are speeches that occur during his presidency. So we'll begin then with the later career of Abraham Lincoln and then in our next lesson, look at both of those short speeches, the Gettysburg Address and the second inaugural. We'll look at them together in the next lesson on Abraham Lincoln. But if you have any questions or comments on Lincoln's House Divided speech, please post them to the discussion board.